This is the Art of Living Well Radio Network. Radio to inspire enlightened living. You're listening now to the Honest to God series with Anne Gail Rose and Ahanu. Good morning, everybody, from lovely San Diego, California. Ahanu, I actually think I'm getting used to living here. Especially when you hear all the other cities that we're familiar with and that we're known around the world and they're deep in snow and frost and ice and storms and all sorts, you know. I mean, we don't wish that on anybody, but we are just so blessed and we're very, very grateful. And we really would love to be able to share this wonderful blue skies and warm, sunny days. (laughs) I know we're making everybody jealous. Anyway, yes, we do wake up to sunshine and blue skies just about every day. It is a little chilly here today, but we have a wonderful, wonderful show again today. And Hano, Penny Kelly is coming on once again, and we're going to be talking about her book, Consciousness and Energy, and Consciousness Itself. I can't wait. Consciousness, consciousness, consciousness. It's everywhere these days, especially if you're in the groove of consciousness. You know, there is that, obviously there is that sector of the population that don't care what consciousness is. They're not aware of consciousness. They don't know what awareness is. They don't want to know what awareness is. And that's fine too. But anybody who's in the sector, who's in the groove, in the business, hears and receives emails every day and hears it everywhere they go, this growth of awareness, this consciousness. And we so much look forward to speaking to Penny Kelly today, who's a writer, teacher, consultant. She's a speaker, a publisher, and a naturopathic physician. And she's been researching and exploring consciousness, cognition, perception, and intelligence for over 30 years. And Penny has written six books of her own, while at the same time, she publishes books on the subjects of spirituality and health for others. And she will be sharing with us today her experiences of consciousness and the growth of awareness. But before we bring Penny on, I have an absolutely wonderful announcement to make. Wait for this, because this is Consciousness at Work. Are you ready? We're ready, Hannah. Our own Angel Rose is going to be on Coast to Coast AM radio with George Nuri next Wednesday. 10 p.m. to midnight Pacific time. And ladies and gentlemen, you may not know this, but this is consciousness at work because this has been a lifelong dream for Angel Rose. And here we are, after the turn of the Mayan calendar into a whole new era, it actually has manifested. And we so much look forward to that. So do tune in. And if you don't know how to get on that particular show, especially if you're from outside the United States because they do syndicate the show throughout the United States and it's easy to get on. But you can actually listen to it by going to either coasttocoastam.com or you will find the details on our own website, on Angel Rose's website particularly. That's angelrose.com. I spell it A-I-N-G-E-A-L-R-O-S-E.com. Angel, of course, being the Irish word for angel, and that she is. So you'll be listening to an angel on the airwaves. <laughs> oh, my God. Can you tell he's my he's my promoter? Thank you for that, Ahano. I am tickled to be on the show after uh, all these years of my life when I used to listen to Coast to Coast AM. She's back in my 30s. That's how long it's been around. I won't tell anyone how old I am now. But it is a dream come true for me, and I do hope that anybody who listens has a good time. The one thing that she is very concerned about, though, let me tell you, is that truth comes across. Now, this is something that we're going to be speaking with Penny Kelly today when we talk about consciousness, because to me, it's hard to know whether they're the same truth applies at different levels of awareness. You know, what may be true for one person at a particular level of understanding may not be true for somebody else. And we query, we query Penny Kelly about that today. But this is the one thing that Angel Rose is very, very keen about, that anything she says, whether it's through her book, A Time of Change, and her forthcoming book, also The Nature of Reality, whether it's through any of those mediums or through the profundities that we put up on her website, or whether it's the actual radio broadcasts that we do 
on various stations, including this one. It's the truth that we really, really are keen to put across. So let's hold our standards high and let's be very, very clear with source and with ourselves and work towards this principle of self-honesty so that we can reach the that aspect of ourselves that is aspiring to go home to source. Yes, that's very, very true, and it's one of the reasons why we love having Penny on so often, and she doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to ask her to come on probably at least every month or six weeks for a show. She has so much uh, wealth of information to share, and Penny has written numerous books, and she's written two books called Consciousness and Energy, Volume 1 and Volume 2, Multidimensionality and a Theory of Consciousness. And is a true pioneer in terms of her research and her experimentation into other dimensions. So I can't wait to sink our teeth into this. But before we do, I also have to remind our listeners that wonderful Ahano here, not only is he a wonderful webmaster and support, but he is also a phenomenal visionary artist. And if you've not seen his work, you need to go to ahano.com. That's A-H-O-N-U dot com and take a look at his incredible art. You know, that's how he made me fall in love with him, ladies and gentlemen, from across the pond. He was over there in Ireland and he sent me all these little images of all his beautiful watercolor paintings that he had done of nature and harbors in Ireland and mountain scenes. And, of course, you know, once a girl sees that, she's sunk. (laughs) <laughs> I think it took a little bit more than that to actually sink you, Angel Rose. Okay, enough of that. Now, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to Penny Kelly. She was with us on the show just after Christmas and before New Year, and we spoke about consciousness too. And she was also on two weeks where we spoke about the elves of Lily Hill Farm. So let me give you a little bit of background so that we put all this in context of who Penny Kelly is and where she's coming from and what gives her the ability and the right and the authority to speak about consciousness. Well, we mentioned she's a writer, a teacher, a consultant, a speaker, publisher, and naturopathic physician. She's the owner of Lily Hill Farm and Learning Center in Southwest Michigan, where she teaches courses in developing the gift of intuition, getting well again naturally, and organic garden. Penny has been researching and exploring consciousness, cognition, perception, and intelligence for over 30 years. And she works with Dr. William Levengood, biophysicist of Pinelandia Laboratory near Ann Arbor, Michigan. And she's been deeply involved in community gardening efforts. She has her own small publishing company called Kelly Networks, LLC, that publishes books on the subject of spirituality and health. She holds a degree in humanistic studies from Wayne State University in Detroit, and she has a degree in naturopathic medicine from Clayton College in Birmingham, Alabama. She maintains a large counseling practice, works as a consultant to schools and corporations, and raises organic vegetables, cows, and chickens. She lives and writes in Lawton, and she is the mother of four children, and she's co-written 14 books with others. And she's written six books of her own. Angel Rose has only mentioned two. But let's list them out. She's written The Evolving Human, The Elves of Lily Hill Farm, Robes, A Book of Coming Changes, Getting Well Again Naturally from the Soil to the Stomach. And the two that we're particularly concerned with today are Consciousness and Energy, Volume 1, which is about multidimensionality and the theory of consciousness, and Consciousness and Energy, Volume 2, about new worlds of energy. And we have got stuck into those books, and I can tell you something, they are a riveting read. Bring on Penny. Are you there, Penny? Yes, I am. Good morning to you over there in Michigan. How's the weather? Oh, it is cold, and it's snowing, (laughs) and it's getting deeper. (laughs) Um, We're talking about San Diego, and I was thinking, what am I doing here? (laughs) Mm. Well, I do miss seeing the snow, though, but only around Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> oh, can I send you some? You can have it all. <laughs> well, oh. Kenny, Penny, we're really looking forward to this conversation today. And, um, you know, as we have you on, we, we try to get through all of your books that we want to talk about. And uh, everyone is just so interesting. So I've begun reading your consciousness and energy. I have copious notes here 
uh, to talk to you with you about. But I first wanted to go back. Last time we were on, we were talking about the elves at your farm. But one of the things I don't think we covered was, I know you had a continual conflict about uh, when to actually put all of your energy into um, working the farm and making that your business. And, you know, I would like you to talk a little bit, if you could, about that transition from, you know, working externally, you know, in the public to going and developing the farm. And the reason I'm asking you this is because so many people have a problem with doing what they love to do with the worry about how are they going to support themselves financially. So could you tell us how you made that shift? Wow, I don't know if I can, Ann Gail. I know that it was a tremendous conflict, and I went back and forth and back and forth. And um, and the thought that I had was this encouragement from the elves and the nature spirits to, quote, develop the farm. And I thought they wanted me to develop it to plant corn and soybeans and things like that. And it wasn't until much later, I'm going to say right around, right before the book actually, the Elf's book actually went to print, that it started to dawn on me that maybe they weren't talking about developing corn and soybean and an income that would be based on that. Maybe they were talking about feeding. I I kept getting messages to feed people. And so I'm thinking, food, food, more food. And it turned out actually that what I was being encouraged to do was to feed people at a different level. Yes, I did sell organic vegetables and and chicken and eggs and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it really, it just evolved naturally. And so all of a sudden, and it wasn't really very sudden. <laughs> it was long and difficult. But gradually, I should say more accurately would be gradually, I realized that I was so busy with my clients and with writing and with speaking that I just, you know, it, the the development of the farm was happening in people's consciousness. And that was bringing in enough income that I ended up letting go of educational consulting, which was, I was a specialist in accelerated teaching and learning. And and focusing 100% on just trying to keep up with the phone calls and the letters and the requests for consultations. So it just happened by itself. Now, I would like to say one other thing about that because that, it just kind of flows very naturally into this whole subject of consciousness. Within each individual, there is a core of energies that are moving, flowing, shaping, the individual and what that individual is naturally um, leaning toward or moving toward or would love to do with their time and life and their energy. That that core of, you know, of leanings, I guess I would call it, and the, the dream that goes with it is something that we have to begin paying attention to or we're not going to be able to transform the world. Because when you have a whole world of people who are basically living, you know, in such a way that it's all about money, and and we need money because we've set the whole darn thing up to have to have money to buy everything we need, then basically what you have is a world full of people who are living a lie, which is not sustainable, which will then collapse. So, yes. and that transition, Penny, you were very conscious. You were you were consciously aware. You were aware of the elves. You were aware of elementals. You were aware of the growth of awareness in your own consciousness. Were you getting little niggles of 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 promptings to make you change from being a, a, you know working a vineyard to move into this? Learning Center. You, you've actually started Lily Hill, Lily Hill Farm and Learning Center in mm-hmm. Southwest Michigan. Were you getting promptings that you ignored for some time? And you know, is, do you think that's part of us 
dropping all of our external needs on money and that kind of thing and just running with our intuition and doing what it is that we love. I did get a lot of... They weren't little niggles, though, Ahanu. They were like hits in the face, <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> yes. The telephone pole, the proverbial knock in the head. Um, and I was ignoring those because I couldn't figure out rationally how I was going to make that change. And mm-hmm. in the end, you know, the, the changes just kept on coming. If I had facilitated those, um, and here was the thing that I think was really the biggest lesson of all, which is something that I'm still dealing with, which, you know, I don't know if that will ever go away in the world that we have today. How does one set their life up to be able to live on what they make, what they can afford, and what they want to do? And whatever amount of money that dream life makes if you have your life set up and you've got, you know, 10 children and, uh, you know, 6,000 square foot house or, or, you know, all kinds of debts, um, then you're not really free to do much of anything without causing a whole lot of grief and difficulty and, and for everybody concerned. And so it becomes an act of courage and that, you know, is a whole different subject. Um, you know, I've been through all that. It was worth it. Um, you know, it was really, really tough, but it was worth it. Um, and I, I wouldn't do anything different if I had to do it again. I might, um, I might do it a little faster. You know, I might listen a little faster, but, um, we have to take charge of our life at some point. And that is, you know, with the path of balance. Yeah, and in setting that up is, um, you know, is is really a tough. It's a tough walk. Okay, Penny, could you go back to what you were saying earlier about all of us having a core within us? Um, could you explain that a little bit better? Is that similar to people setting up like a life contract before they're born, or or how would you explain that? It is similar to that, but it goes beyond that. I believe, uh, you know, that at this point, there's quite a bit of evidence that every single individual born on the planet is born in response. The energies that form that child are stamped at the moment of conception, and those energies will then proceed to unfold within that child, and that child will be an answer to a problem or the filling of a need, or the expression of an idea or a gift or something along those lines. Now, what happens with us is that we get born, and immediately, you know, the parents start shaping or not shaping, as the case might be, the whole consciousness of the individual, and pretty soon we're locked in this little tiny box with a whole bunch of rules, and that's as far as we go. When you start looking out of the box and you start acting in accord with something much deeper, the question that I was asking at one point is, my God, you know, um, the question about the rabbit hole, <laughs> how far does this go? Um, yeah. How do we, where do we, where do I stop? How do I do this? And um, it isn't a question actually of of stopping it's a question of how do i begin to to act in such a way that i'm in alignment with those energies because that's where all your health is that's where all your power is that's where your ability to evolve is centered and we just do not give that any not even lip service in most cases mm-hmm. You mentioned health there, Penny. Do you think that if somebody doesn't follow that instinct, doesn't follow that intuition, doesn't follow those promptings, do you think it leads to ill health? Is there a connection between that? Yes, because the individual is this. um, Let me paint a picture of you of it for just a moment. The individual is this this pool, if you will, of absolutely swarming lights, little lights everywhere. 
And those are the, the energies moving through the individual. Now, if the individual is constructed in such a way that they have certain kinds of energies moving through them, those energies, every single wave, every single frequency, carries a certain type of information. And that information is then embedded in or part of what feeds the cells of the body. The cells arise in response to the form, the formations of the energies that are flowing through the individual. When you don't act in accord with that energy flowing through, you stop that. It remains blocked. And the cells that would normally be fed by that energy end up shriveling, getting sick, eventually becoming diseased, and the person gets old, and the result is death. So, so, so it, Penny, it's how very can, critical. How, how can somebody um, find out about their own energies that way? Because, as you mentioned, so many of us are, you know, once we're born, then we start to become molded by our parents and schools and religions and all of that happy stuff. So how does somebody locate or find out what their energies are? You know, it's you have to go within. And usually one of the questions that I ask people, um, both in private consulting and in my classes, is well, what would you do if you could do anything you wanted if you had all the education you needed and all the money you needed and all the permission you needed and you didn't have to support anybody or anything, what would you do? You know, what's the, the one thing that you would love to do? And sometimes I will say, what is the one thing that you would love to do even if you didn't get paid for it? And they know. They know almost immediately what that is. Now, once in a while, somebody will say, I don't know. And so then I will go after that information so that I know, but I very seldom will tell anybody directly what that is because then I just become somebody else telling, you know, other people what to do. And that does not further one's own inner authority, which has to um, begin to operate and has to take precedence. You have to listen to that inner authority over everything else. And if I'm telling you what it is, you haven't earned it. You haven't gone after it. And it's very easy then for people to discount that, that information because they don't know if they can trust it. But if they go after it, and I will set things up, you know, as a teacher so that you will end up running right smack into your, um, you know, that thing that you love mm -hmm. and, and you discover that yourself, then I will say you've got it. You're on right. it. Well, I have, a, I have a perfect example of that, except that I do think when somebody sits about seeking clarity, even, even if that is consulting somebody else or getting advice from mm -hmm. somebody else, that's them, in my opinion, that's them acting on some intuition and, and seeking the clarity. And as I said, I have, a, I have a perfect example of that. There was a woman came to me one time. Well, let me backtrack just for a moment just to, so people understand. When Angel Rose mentioned that I was uh, a visionary artist, what I can do is I can actually see into a person's energy field and I paint what I see in there. Now, there was a woman who came to me at one point in time, and when I looked into her energy field, I, I, I'm going to paint this picture in your mind for you. I saw a pair of hands that were pointing down towards the, towards the ground, and there was all these gold coins flowing out of her hands. And, I mean, it was a simple but very, very clear picture. And I just said to her, I knew nothing about her, and I just said to her, you're losing money. Well, do you know what? She turned around in shock, and she said, I've just lost $3 million dollars. Ooh. Now, I wasn't surprised. I mean, I was surprised at the amount of money, but I wasn't surprised because what had happened was the consciousness that she was in had manifested itself in her auric field. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I could see it. That's right. Now, the, interestingly enough, though, Penny, the fix of it was quite easy because I said to her, look, take this picture, but turn it up the other way so that the coins are coming into your hands. You know, instead of the hands pointing down towards the ground, <laughs> turn the picture upside down so that the pictures are pointing up to heaven as it were and the coins are flowing into your hands. And I said, 
take that picture home, put it in your bedroom or in your kitchen or somewhere where you're going to see it all the time. And what, what happens with these pictures is it creates the new paradigm or it instills it through what we call pineal induction. I mean, I don't know mechanically or physically how, how it happens, but that's what happened because a short time after that, we got the report back that she had recovered every single penny. Oh, very good. Mm. Yes. So, Penny, you know, Penny, this leads me into, you know, I really want to have this discussion today about reality. So I, I, I'm going to switch gears just for a moment here, and I want to go back to the Kundalini itself. Okay. And I want to go back to it in relation to what, you, what you're speaking about in terms of us having these wealth of energies inside of us. And <clears throat> I don't know if many people really understand Kundalini and what it's for and what it's about. So, so could you tell our listeners what you know about that? Okay. Um, let me say two things. One is the old description and then a new description. Okay. Kundalini was in the old, in the ancient teachings, was something known as a force or an energy that was coiled up at the base of the spine and that would spring open like a snake un uncoiling itself, would spring open up through the body and it, and it was dangerous and it was, you know, you could go insane and, you know, all these difficulties, et cetera, et cetera. And you had to be guided by someone who was very knowledgeable um, to be able to learn to manage these, you know, these new abilities. Nobody ever said what the abilities were. Nobody ever really said what actually happened in the experience. You know, all of that was um, hidden esoteric information. So, you know, here I am in 1978, an engineer for Chrysler, um, doing my thing, had never heard of metaphysical anything, never read a metaphysical book. Um, and I have this experience one night while making love and, and didn't even really get into making love. In fact, it was a very unusual kind of force almost that, you know, that drew me to the bed. Um, it, and it was just extremely powerful. And I just went with it. There was no resistance, um, nothing. And all of a sudden, just started to make love. And there's this roaring, rumbling sound. And I thought, oh, we're having an earthquake. And then the next thought instantly was, oh, you know, the jets are taking off from Selfridge Air Force Base just down the road. And then, you know, the, and then there was this sound and feeling of a freight train moving up through the center of my body and just exploding at various points. Kaboom, kaboom. And then, you know, and very quickly hit my brain, exploded, and all of my ordinary consciousness was gone. I was done. It was over. Um, and I was just floating in the sky or in this huge void of blackness with billions of these little twinkling lights that were spreading out in every direction into infinity as far as I could see. And there was no I to be seeing. There was no me. There was no awareness that I was a human. You lose all of that, every single bit of that. And, and what about your husband, Penny? Did he perceive in any shape or form, anything that was happening to you, or was, all, was it all internal to you? It's all internal. All of it is internal. And that brings up a point, Ahanu, that I think is very, very important. Two people can look at the same uh, message, the same action, the same event, and have totally different impressions from that. And, it, and each message, each person, gets the message that is appropriate for their energy system. So that is very, very important. Things will happen that one won't see, and other things will happen that the other one won't hear, et cetera, et cetera. So this kundalini, what it literally uh, ended up being, what I ended up figuring out, took me a long time to figure this out, was that there was a an electromagnetic force or charge uh, that just all of a sudden every single chakra in my body lined up 
in perfect alignment with one another, and they must have gotten somehow into perfect um, frequencies so that each each chakra was a perfect uh, complement, if you will, to receive uh, the the energies coming from the chakra next to it. And this whole huge force moved up. What happens in the process is that your brain is rewired, your nervous system is re is destroyed and rebuilt in a matter of a second or two. Um, my consciousness was awakened, and overnight, in a and this was very distressing. I was having out of the body experiences. I was reading people's minds. I was seeing and being in two places at once. I was absolutely terrified that all of the boundaries of perception were gone. Anything that I was curious about was right there. The information was right there. Experiences that I, I mean, I had experiences that were absolutely phenomenal. I couldn't tell whether I was awake or asleep. I did not sleep, in fact, for three years. Um, and, and so that there was just a very, very difficult period, um, in which I thought I was going insane. And then little by little, um, just like a newborn learns to manage reality bit by bit, about two and a half, three years into this whole experience, I finally got to a point where I could say no. And oh, <laughs> to certain experiences, or I could turn off or turn away from information coming in. And, uh, you know, and I tell people in a sort of a joking way, but it's not really joking at all. I ended up maintaining a, an eight track consciousness in which different channels of information were always on and always operating, and I was, you know, filtering through those different kinds of information all the time and able to pick up all sorts of things, visual, auditory, kinesthetic, precognitive, you know, past, um, alternate realities, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. Kundalini That's... is a change in the way one's body-mind system processes information. Wow. Well, now... We're speaking with Penny Kelly about consciousness. You're listening to Angel Rose and Ahanu on the Honest to God series radio show. We broadcast every Saturday at 8 a.m. Pacific time, 9 a.m. Mountain, 10 Central, 11 Eastern, and for our friends in Europe, 3 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. And Penny Kelly can be contacted at pennykelly.com. If anybody would like to call in to the show, it's 805-292-0349. Penny, we do have a few callers on the line. Would you be interested in taking a question from somebody? Sure. Yes. Well, let's, let's speak to area code 901. Go ahead, caller. Hello. Hello. Hi. This is Hi. Lenise. Okay. And my question... Hi. My question is, is there anything that you can do to promote the kundalini energy to come in? Um, wow. Uh, yes, there are. Uh, they take tremendous amount of discipline, but, you know, if you stick with it, I think one of the first things uh, to do is to be able to move into um, what I'm going to call a, a place of unconditional acceptance of everything going on around you without becoming a doormat. That's very difficult. It's, it's challenging for people to get their mind around, but it's not all that difficult to do. Meditation helps. Intention helps. Exercise, I, I would say you have to be in pretty good physical shape um, because the initial kundalini experience was only the first one. Following that, there were tremendous, um, you know, tremendously disturbing other experiences, almost all of them sexual. You end up figuring out what sex really is, in fact. Um, your heart will get going up to, uh, I would be guessing here, because I never really stopped to, you know, put a, a meter on or, or test it, but um I used to say my heart was going 180 to 200 beats a minute. It was just going like a buzzsaw. Um, um, tremendous amounts of heat or or cold move through the body. 
um, paralysis. If you fight the energy, it is dangerous because it may explode out of some organ. And so there has to be this absolute trust that this intelligent energy, because that's what it is, knows what it's doing. And beyond that, you know, it's, it, your geography, where you're at, literally, your physical health, your attitude toward life, all of that comes into it. I accidentally stepped into it. I didn't know what hit me or why. I look back now and I see that, it, you know, it was a moment where I was just open to whatever w- was moving through me at that moment. And it resulted in this tremendous explosion <clears throat> or alignment. It's really an alignment of energies that changed everything about my body, mind system. My chemistry was different, everything. So, you know... Okay. It, Yes, thank you, thank you, caller, for that. And Penny, I, I think too for the caller's question, yours seemed to just occur spontaneously. That's right. So I have two questions. Like, do you think that, you know, that was arranged for you prior to coming in, or like, you know, I mean, what caused it for you to just suddenly happen? Nothing. That's the that's the great mystery. You can have a spontaneous totally unpredicted and unknown experience that's one path not my recommended path by the way because it is so very difficult the other way is a slow and steady you know uh, uh, work with diet work with consciousness meditation intention um, you know changing yourself Um, you need to develop a tremendous amount of self-control tremendous amount of discipline, tremendous amount of patience, um, and you have to have a sense of timing, when to say yes and when to say no to any particular experience. And, you know, all of that can result in a very slow, gradual opening of kundalini a little bit at a time, and that works just as well as the difficulties, you know, works, I think, better um, than what I had um, you know, what I had was not, I wouldn't recommend it. So, Okay. Well, now you did bring up the topic of sex. So I do have to mm-hmm. say then, um, could you tell us what sex is really all about? Um, but here's the, the thing. Um, when you go into that void and you're in, at, at that point, you're in the source. That source, that Godhead, whatever name you've got for it, is an incredibly blissful state. And it is, I would say, probably a million times more ecstatic and feels a million times better than your best sexual orgasm. Okay? It's like an orgasm that's steady, doesn't quit. You don't have any consciousness of anything else at that moment of orgasm. And when you get into the Godhead, you are in one long, continuous, paralyzing, in a sense, orgasm in which you have no consciousness of yourself as an individual. That sexual experience that we have originally was simply an attempt to go back to the source of ourself and reconnect and say thank you and, you know, and re-experience that bliss, et cetera, et cetera. And somehow over the years, over the millennia, the whole sexual thing became just this awful, awful, ridiculous set of rules and regulations. Um, people would get, people who did end up touching the Godhead end up coming into contact with power. And the um, <clears throat> the result was powerful people, and I think somewhere along the line, some of the leaders, leadership that we had, um, didn't want people to be in that power, didn't want them to have those kinds of powers. Um, and so they started, uh, you know, restricting access to the opposite sex. Sometimes, you know, males were separated from the females. 
um, you know, all kinds of silly things. And he got the teaching that sex is only for procreation. You know, that that's just simply not true. That mm-hmm. is just a control mechanism for people to remain ignorant about where their power is. Because if you end up touching that power, you are different from that yes. point forward, and there's no going back. Penny, the, you, you speak, when you talk about Kundalini, you know, you use words like you have to be disciplined and self-control and that kind of thing. And you mentioned about, it, you know, it took you two, three years to actually recover. Uh, that's my word. But um, why, why should such a blissful experience be such a difficulty for us, do you think? Because it raises us another notch on the evolutionary ladder. And the things that are possible after you have experienced that initial reorganization of your fields, your energy fields, is not something that you can trifle with. For instance, um, let's go back to your question in the beginning, Angel, about the conflict that I had with, you know, educational consulting and, and pursuing my path, following my heart. After Kundalini, it becomes impossible to live in such a way that you are not following your truth, that you are not following your energies. Right, yes, yes, that yes. It, there's just no getting around that. So, you I, know, that's a problem right there. Right off the bat, yeah. there's a problem. Yes. Can you recreate the Kundalini experience? I mean, you obviously had such a thrilling and, and exciting experience. Can you Can you possibly go back into that? Can you bring it on at will? Or do you think it's the one-off? Yes, you can. Um, And I have. However, I think the thing that's important to note here is that there wasn't just one initial experience. There were three massive initial experiences. And then after that, um, they kind of toned down a little bit to a bit of rumbling, you know, a spontaneous orgasm, um, and sometimes these huge flashes of light. Um, you know, it's very inconvenient when you're trying to drive or do your grocery shopping or whatever. And, um, and you know, meditation. I have um, gotten into periods where once this is, once you allow this energy, and it's not really allowing, once you once this energy begins operating in your body-mind system, it renews its own self from time to time. It is a an intelligent, incredibly intelligent force at, that is operating, and every so often there'll be this whole string of, um, you know, renewing experiences, n- not quite as not quite as dramatic as the first ones because I'm not quite as far out of alignment as I was initially. So the, they're more like, um, you know, I, I would say, um, well, they can still be pretty dramatic, <laughs> you know, but they're easier to deal with. And maybe it's just that my view of them has changed and and I'm able to integrate the um, you know the the changes that they bring or the renewal that it brings. So um, Kundalini, once beginning, continues on of its own accord. The um, you know you can fight it. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that, but um, it's Penny, something you, that's wonderful. Penny, do you have to have sex to stimulate Kundalini energy? No, no. But Kundalini triggers. A sexual orgasm. Okay. And would you call that the God within? I would. Okay. I would. It is a a function of the God within for that to occur. Fantastic time for us to take a quick little break. We remind our listeners that you're listening to Angel Rose and Ahanu on the Honest to God series radio show. And we're speaking with Penny Kelly about consciousness. Her new, her book is not new. It's been out for some time, Consciousness and Energy, particularly Volume 1, Multidimensionality and a Theory of Consciousness. We'll be back right after this. This is the Art of Living Well Radio Network. Radio to inspire enlightened living. The 
Honest to God series with Anne Gail Rose and Ahanu. So welcome back, everybody, from our short little break. We are speaking with Penny Kelly, who I just admire um, your experiences in your research so much, Penny. So this is <laughs> invaluable you. information, and I, I do have so many other questions. But, you know, as far as the Kundalini and the God within, I'm going to ask you then, what do you think we exist for? How do we, you know, what is our existence as human beings and where are we meant to go, especially in, in line with what you've just said about the Kundalini and how it changes us? Well, um, there's a couple of things. First thing I would say is the reason for our existence is to further life, is to express life, is to enjoy life. And we don't have to enjoy it, but if we're alive, in a form, the body is a form, then we are a form of life. And there is just a tremendous number of other forms out there that we can interact with and build worlds with and et cetera. And that is the purpose. And and that, you know, Kundalini, when you get into the full Kundalini experience, what you run into is this this void in which the only thought that exists is I am and what you realize is that that the force of that is overwhelming and and the force of that I am is what is at the basis or the core of all life that is the life force and your ability to say yep I am too <laughs> you know and he is or he am or she is <laughs> etc um, that's that's the life force in action Mm-hmm. That why is think, that's it. Penny, why do you think that you need to get out of the body if you're saying that we have the body to enjoy life? Um, what do you mean, get out of the body? Like have an out of body experience? Yes, because you you described when you were describing your Kundalini yes. experience, you were saying how you know it was a sense of coming out of the body. Uh, well, it wasn't really, the, the initial experiences were not a sense of coming out of the body. It was a sense of the body having dissolved completely and no longer existed. Okay? But when, once you are, once you have been introduced to the kind of consciousness that is, that exists in the world and you discover it's unlimited, that that freedom, that ability, and it really frightened me in the beginning, but that is a freedom then to explore consciousness in every direction. Mm-hmm. And you end up out of the body because the thing that you're interested in doesn't happen to be within physical range of the body's eyes, ears, or skin, or hands. Right. Yes. So do you think anybody who practices, say, through meditation or through any other technique, if they practice getting out of their body, do you think that would lead to a, a Kundalini experience? It might. It might. Certainly it would lead to some proficiency with out-of-body experiences. <clears throat> but that's only one small facet of consciousness. And right. the the goal with Kundalini is to take the boundaries off of consciousness and to make the experience of life much richer and more full. And there's also a very, very, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to say a, a very much richer, much richer um, world out there once you're out of the consciousness box that you were raised in. There's Does many, many more potentials. For people, oh. to, for people to break down those perceptions, you know, of how they were taught about reality, you know, does that take a long time? I mean, you know, when you think that you start being programmed from the get-go. Yeah. Uh, is that part of the difficulty is for us to be able to loose our perceptions on what we think reality is or what it can contain? Um, it can take a long time. Uh, it does for many people. But there are a few people who will have um, something that I call a moment of oneness or a peak um, peak moment 
uh, and they become aware that there's something much more than what they be- believed. They then begin asking questions and, and searching. Mm-hmm. Now, your book, Consciousness and Energy, Volume 1, in a chapter called Double Takes on Reality, I'd love to read just one paragraph because it, it, it's okay. gripping. It says, Later that afternoon, I was sitting at the computer in my loft, working with great concentration on my writing. In the background of my perception, I was aware of the bough of a large tree immediately to my left, and for quite a while had the vague perception that I was up in the trees. When I finally took a break and looked up, I realized that I was, of course, in the loft, and that what I'd been perceiving as the limb of a tree was the huge barn beam next to my desk. Looking at the beam was a lingering sense of surprise. The question, you talking to me, popped into my mind. Immediately, the beam began talking, to telling me of its former life as a black walnut tree before becoming part of the barn. Sympathetically, I reached out to put my hand on its rough-hewn surface. I was thanking it for being part of my home when little prickles of electricity ran up my arm and I suddenly became aware that the beam was touching me back. That sounds like an absolutely wonderful experience. Is that recognition of all life everywhere, consciousness being everywhere and in everything? Yes. Yes, and and everything is made of that life force. Everything is alive. Everything can be communicated with. Um, It's an amazing reality. We are in a reality system, and we have not begun to even scratch the surface of what's possible within that system. Let's, Let's move into that subject, Penny, a little bit more, because I know you've done extensive experimentation, uh, getting out of your body and, and exploring other aspects of yourself, even in multidimensional realities. So can you start to tell us the expanded version of reality? What What is there waiting for us all to discover? Um, I think probably the most shocking thing is that um, we have gotten into this habit of believing in death and, in fact, of enacting death. Instead of simply enacting continuous and ongoing transformation, I think that a second thing that is uh, what I would call an expanded version is that we are uh, limited in, a, in many ways to the location that we're at. Most people are limited to that location and they're limited to a few interactions at a very low level, um, you know, with the world around them, with other people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, They have not, as I mentioned, even begun to scratch the surface of what their own, you know, their consciousness could do. But what, you know, some of the things at least that I've done, if I can do them, anybody can learn to do them, um, are to see across town or to hear what's going on in somebody's heart or to look at what's going on in another physical body and see where the blockages are, you know, to being healthy, to transport myself, you know, without aid of a vehicle, Um, you know, things like that. That's all... Um, to you know, to be in two places or three places at once, um, consciousness is far more creative and far more powerful than we want to think it is. And we, I think, are just now starting to, you know, peck our way out of the shell like a little, <laughs> you know, baby chick um, and look out at a different kind of reality that's out there. Oh, and I, I have two Two more questions that spring off of that, and one is, you know, you mentioned that we've bought into this belief in death, and I think we have mentioned that before on another show with you. We've touched on it lightly, and I do remember as a child, you know, when someone died, I was shocked. I was like, well, what do you mean? You know, this, <laughs> this isn't normal. Uh-huh. Okay, so I, I've always had that memory, and of course, you know, I was told that I saw things in rose-colored glasses, but... 
but how does one unravel the belief in death? And, and, and the other part of that, Penny, is what does it look like to to not have to die? I mean, do you just, is it physical immortality? Is it translating yourself into light? And that that's the first question. And then it was on my list about teleporting and bilocating, and I know our listeners are going to want to know, how do you do that? So wow. those are my two questions. Okay. Um, so your your first comment, how did you say that? Something about what does it look like? Um, let me say this about about death. Um, death is an attempt. Death is a way of ending an experience because we can't see any other way out of the box that we've built around ourselves. Okay. And so literally we end up in a box and put it in the ground and hope that it will, you know, go back to the, to the earth. If, if, let me say, okay. So what you become aware of with Kundalini is that you've got this physical body and this physical body is made up of these energies that flow through it and affect it deeply and change its operation and its chemistry and its um its physical act- action potential in you know thousands of different ways and then you you also have to realize that there's a, another world out there that is the world made by energies and the and they the stuff in that world is not quite as rigid it's not quite as programmed. It's not quite as limited as the world that we live in every day. Um, and so you begin to, I began to explore that other world and discovered that there's a tremendous amount of power in that world to make things happen. And, and you, you can teach yourself to become lucid and in that world. And what you then begin to realize is that there's this parallel, I guess I'll call it, between the physical world and what's happening in the physical world and what's happening in that energetic world. And and when I say there's a parallel between the two, what I mean is that the energies supporting the two are identical and the expression of those energies is slightly different. It will be a physical expression in the physical world, and it will be something that looks crazy, perhaps, um, in the energy world, but we will call that, quote, a dream, unquote. Now, what, what I did was learn the language of energy so that when I was walking in that world of energy, I could see, know, feel, and make happen things that I wanted to have happen in the physical world because I knew the language of energy. I knew what all form is simply a symbol of energy. So, for instance, if we had a dream here and we were dissecting a dream, I would, you know, be able to look at the dream. Whoever had the dream is creating that dream. And because of the language contained in the dream, I can see exactly what's going on in that person's life and, you know, what needs to go on and, you know, what has to shift, etc. And so you begin to be able to walk in both worlds and create a certain amount of order or have a, you know, you're not at the mercy of craziness in Mm -hmm. either of the worlds. Mm -hmm. So that ends up changing your physical mortality because the rules in the energetic world do not include the uh, rules of aging. And when you begin to then live mostly in that energy world, your aging slows down and I believe it can come to a stop. And, you know, the end of Consciousness and Energy Volume 2, I was just, you know, hitting that point where I was realizing, oh my God, you know, we are not supposed to be dying, et cetera. And wow. Wow. Well, uh, for anybody who wants to get hold of these books of, written by Penny Kelly, I'm sure they can get them on Amazon.com or go to PennyKelly.com. I, I hope I'm correct in saying that, Penny. Now, a question I have, 
and it relates to what you just said there about the individuation and the merging of all energies. And I'm wondering about where does where do you draw the line between you know knowing that every everything is energy and we're all one and the individuation of cells and the ego. And particularly, I'm drawn by your paragraph that says, in mid-January, I went to bed for the night but was unable to sleep. After rolling around for a while, trying to get comfortable and letting my mind drift, I noticed a funny set of lines that looked like a crackled surface, like something you might see in the glaze of old pottery. I looked at it without any conscious thought or curiosity, and suddenly I was looking at the surface of water in a small pool through the eyes of someone who was Chinese. The crackled lines were actually the surface of the water reflecting light in many directions. The shock of realizing that I was seeing through someone else's eyes the clear perception of the young Chinese man and the first sense of being in China brought me right back to my full attention in my bed. My bed. Who was the young man? Was that me? So how do you... I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Explain yeah. that, please. <laughs> well, um, let me let me say two things about the all our one comment, and then about the young man in China. We are all made of the same stuff, but I think uh, you know that we are not all one yet. Um, that's a favorite saying in metaphysical circles. We're all one. It just confuses most people. Um, we're all made of this same stuff, this life force, this Godhead stuff called the I am. And that, that I am stuff makes it possible for you to get into or be inside or connect with, you know, almost anything that you want to put your, your attention on. But the forms, remain separate. You and I and my desk and my office door, we're all separate things. The oneness is in knowing that we can communicate without any obstacles. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's go to the young man in China because this is really an interesting piece for me. Um, at the time that I, you know, found myself looking through his eyes, there was a feeling that was so profound that I was living in China as a young man. And, and that, you know, that I never really resolved that a hundred percent. So I just left it dangling there. That's how I learn. It becomes a part of the mystery. And I will hold pieces of that mystery for sometimes a decade or two before I've got an answer for that. Um, and what I've, and so let me say this also that I have discovered that you don't have random perceptions. Everything has meaning to you. So I was, um, having a conversation last Monday with a gentleman that, um, you know, long story short, was he's working in China. They're building um, huge cities in China that are 100% sustainable, organic, um, self-sufficient, new forms of energy, all kinds of stuff. Um, and, they're, and the difficulty that they're going to run into when they bring people into these cities this, each city will, is built to hold one million people, and they have this huge migration happening in China um, of like 20 million people a year moving off the land and into cities, and they don't have enough cities. And so they set up, oh, this is our opportunity to create, um, you know, something that would be, uh, you know, that, that's new something that is not based on the old ideas of industrialism and so on. And so in the course of the conversation, the question became, you know, how are you going to, you know, this is me asking him, how are you going to move a million people into a city when they're bringing their old consciousness with them? If you want them to be able to live in a way that 
you know, really takes that concept of sustainability to heart and good health and organics and being self-sufficient. And, you know, each city raises its own food and has its own little type of industry, et cetera. Um, you need to do some pretty serious training um, and teaching of that consciousness and that development of consciousness so that they will be able to move forward in the new city without turning it into a cesspool or a slum or, you know, whatever. Excuse me. And so there's been this, um, you know, this conversation happening around this whole thing of, of consciousness. And the question became, would you be willing to spend some time in China? And I was, you know, I was pretty surprised, and and I said, yeah, you know, I would. And when I did, um, what flashed through my mind within, you know, the day after that as I was thinking about that whole thing was, wow, you know, I, I had the feeling, which I did not put in the book, that I was going to meet this Chinese, young Chinese man somewhere in the future. Mm-hmm. And that I was going to end up either teaching him or working with him or something. And I thought, isn't that crazy? <laughs> what would I be doing in China? Mm-hmm. And now here is a door that may be opening. And I'm looking at that going, hmm, okay. Um, right. So it's not no perception that an individual has is accidental. They are all very meaningful. Sometimes mm-hmm. they're out of sequence. Um, in the sequence that we're used to seeing things as, but they're very relevant. Okay, Penny, can we move into the topic then of each one of us having multidimensional selves? Could you explain that to our listeners? Oh, absolutely. Do you know what it comes down to, Ann Gail? It's very simple. Consciousness exists in order to create. And if you're not doing something that you love, then it's going to go off and create experiences in a multidimensional way that will be what you love. You just won't be able to enjoy it. It's doing that off on the side. And because we are so narrow and so limited, um, we end up not realizing that we have spun off a chunk of our energy to go do something that we really want to do And, you know, and and so we trudge along doing what we think we should be doing. And what's happening is that we are building this whole array of other selves that live in slightly different dimensions where they're doing what they love to do. Now, they don't go very far and they repeat the same thing over and over and over, which is why we get ghosts. You know, somebody dies and leaves, you know, a slew of multidimensional selves behind and one of them, you know, walks through the halls crying for their great love or whatever. Um, The fact of the matter is that if you do not uh, spend all your time envisioning, I could be doing this. In other words, if you're not present exactly where you are at and you're not focusing in a powerful way, on what you're creating right now at this moment in front of you, then you will be off creating somewhere else and the result is a slight loss of power and a a loss of energy. And the goal becomes to collect those selves and all of the energy that, you know, is yours um, and put them all back into one individual being, which is the being that you are here now today, and to be very silent when you are not creating, you know, you are gathering energy, to be very conscious of gathering that energy, um, and, and being silent so that you do not spin yourself off into other directions, um, and the result is a powerful person. So when you would have your experiences then of meeting a self that was living in another dimension and doing a particular thing, Mm -hmm. then are you saying that that was a fragmentation of yourself and that that other self really didn't have any, like, cohesive spirit of its own? Is that what you're saying? Yes, in a way. Yes, yes, yes. That you're talking about the writer self. I in yes. volume yes. one, I ran into a version of myself 
that was amazingly well developed. And she was so well developed because I had spent so many years trying to get that kind of life going for myself. And I had not succeeded in this dimension. And it was all going to her. It, you know, it, it, she just began to develop and she, um, really, uh, I think was created at a point in time when I only had one child, my first daughter. And, you know, and, and she, um, continued to evolve and to work from that point forward. I think the thing to understand is that if you create a self and that self has enough energy to it, she will begin to create a world of her own. So you and Ahanu and myself and each one of, you know, the other humans on this planet is busy creating an individual world. Many of those worlds overlap in positive ways. I see something that you're making that I could use, and so I'll say, you know, can I have that? I'll give you this dollar for that. And, you know, somebody else wants something that I've got because they want to incorporate that into their world. But they're all private worlds. Collectively, they work together. When you get people who are deliberately creating together to sustain a world, then you get what's called a body of Christs. They are people who are awake, people who are deliberately creating the kind of world that they want to have and they interact with others who have similar thoughts about how the world would work or should work or could work or how they want it to. And that is a very powerful kind of world that has the potential to then become an eternal world. And the people in that kind of world eventually learn to not be subject to death. Where are we then? If you were to look at the state of the world, understanding, you know, I just call it the negative agenda that's, you know, really out to yeah. take more and more of our, our awareness away and enslave us further, and you take that with the potential or the the truth that each one of us is a Christ. And, okay, so then you mentioned this man in China who's working to what I would interpret as a contribution to a Christ world. You know, where do you think we all are in everything, and what advice uh, can you give us? Okay. Um, you know, at, at this point, what I see um, is that we're on the edge of self-destruction. Um, we have set our lives up to be very, very reliant on things that do not deserve that kind of trust. Um, and that includes people and natural systems. We are not in alignment with natural systems. So I think there could, you know, there have been some tremendous difficulties, the most recent one just simply being Hurricane Sandy last fall. Um, so th that edge of destruction feeling is what a lot of people are concerned about right now. Having said that, I, I would mention that I am and have been a student of Don Juan of the Carlos Castaneda series um, for about 33 years now. And so I, I'm a Toltec um, seer. And one of the concepts that we have in the Toltec system is the concept of the petty tyrant. And the more outrageous the tyrant the better the chance that the, uh, we call it a warrior, that the, the better the chance that the awakened one has to become peerless in their use of power and knowing and action and their ability then to manipulate consciousness. I, uh, quite often I look out at the world and I think, wow, we've got a fabulous petty tyrant who is operating as, you know, um, this unseen sort of nebulous but very real um, power in our world who has access to terrible weapons and, and you know, all sorts of rules and mechanisms and, and so on and so forth. And we are not looking at that 
uh, as, as as we're not putting together a strategy that which is what a warrior does puts together a strategy to undo that petty tyrant and uh, you know I have a strategy but most people do not and and I think most people are pretty they they act helpless and and as soon as you believe you're helpless you are and it's not true we are not helpless we have immense power especially collectively at mm-hmm. our disposal and we just need to begin to utilize that and and put it to good uh, to apply it wisely right i want to pop back real quick just because there was a question i wanted to ask penny mm-hmm. and we went past the subject so if you could just answer it for me real quickly when you talked about us leaking our energy and you know going off in different directions and creating different things that are not cohesive with our core principle our core values is that similar to what the native americans would call soul retrieval is, yes is that, it is talk about? right okay so they, they knew what they were talking about when they would do a soul retrieval for somebody that's right that's right and you have to retrieve your energy in order to gather enough power to have enough guts to do what you are here to do right. it's just that so, simple so that that would be one would that be one recommendation that you'd make to somebody in order to try and recover our energy so that we're more creative and and more with our core selves would be to do a soul retrieval. Yes, I would. Right. I would. And Whether you do it with the Indians or you do it with the Toltecs or you do it with a psychologist or you do it, you know, with sure. you know the neighbor, um, it's important to do it. Right. Now, is it something that you could do yourself? Because what you've mentioned many times in your book where you'd be in a, a state of awareness, perhaps through meditation or however you did it, but that you'd find yourself in different locations, that you would be lucid, first of all, and that you would be bilocating or teleporting. Is that how you would do it yourself, retrieve these parts of yourself? Um, not really. That Those states are are good for exploration, but not as good for recovery. If you're going to recover your energy, you have to do two things both at the same time. One, you have to be willing to feel whatever it is you were not willing to feel. And the second, you have to be willing to breathe deeply and allow the feeling of that thing, whatever it is you weren't willing to have, allow the feeling to move all the way through you. And and that has to be done again and again. There are billions, I, I would say, of these little lights and strings of light inside the body mind system, in in the whole in the total system um, of an individual. And each one of those is a little frequency. And when you give up an idea that you love or an action that you want to take or something you want to say because it's not nice or it's not acceptable or whatever, and you adopt somebody else's rule, then you have, in a sense, taken those little fibers of light and switch their their you're trying to switch their imprint and they aren't they don't fit in your system and so you have to let go of those and give those back to the world outside of the self and Mm -hmm. and allow the feeling to flow through Mm -hmm. we don't want to lose the opportunity because we know people will be chomping at the bit to get in touch with you, Penny. I did mention that they could go to pennykelly.com. Are there other ways that people could contact you if they want to go to your uh, uh, Lily Hill Farm and, and Learning Center? Um, well, at this point, um, not really. My website, um, you know, and all my contact information is on the website. People can call. Um, they write, people do write. I spend a huge portion of each week just answering letters and emails and things like that. Um, and I'm getting ready to teach online. I, I'm going to be teaching in the spring. I don't have a date set yet, but, um, I did have, but I'm, it's tentative. I, we're not done with, um, creating the videos yet. And so I think I set the date premature, but, um, I'm going to be creating a small online school for people that have said, you know, are you coming to my part of town? 
and it's like, ooh, you know, I yeah, I can go in two or three places at once, but I'm not sure how effective I can be. So, um, you know, I've decided to get online and to literally right. teach online. Well, will you keep us all up to date with that? Because that that is something yeah. that we would highly recommend for people. Because you know, we we were enthralled with your with your books, with your knowledge, with your ability, with your skill, with your experiences. And certainly, uh, you know, if somebody can't physically make it to Lily Hill Farm and Learning Centre, yeah. we would highly recommend that they take part in your learning programs. Now, just before we're we're moving into the very last segment of our show today. Penny and I. I want to just cover this last little paragraph that I had to. Uh, and Rose actually marked it, and I had to read it. As I cleaned up the dinner dishes, I was deeply aware that if we, as a people, succeed in changing the perceptions that served as the foundation for our present reality, then the entire reality would shift into a new form. I had read somewhere that we were entering a dimensional shift, and the impression left by the article was of a shift that would be forced upon us by something from the outside we would wake up one day and find ourselves in a new place. Now I saw that it was probably going to be something we did to ourselves, a shift of perception in which we became less concerned with physical space and less constricted by time. Right. Yeah. Give, give, us, a, give us a little quick explanation of that. Well, when someone wakes up, when consciousness begins to expand and it begins to, you begin to have perception and feeling that is much broader and deeper and much more expansive than what you're used to, what happens is that you begin to do things differently, you begin to see things differently, you begin to plan things differently, and um, and many of the things that once had a great deal of meaning to you maybe don't have quite as much meaning, and things that you never even considered are suddenly very important. Um, so that's, you know, in terms of what happens when you actually shift um, consciousness, all the things that had meaning change. That's one part of it. The other part of it is the, the thing about time. We have lived for millennia in a time-based reality system. This plant, this earth system is a reality system that we call a time-based reality system. It is not an eternity-based system. It is the planet and the people and all the trees and plants and animals are physical items within an eternal system. But it's very unique here because we have developed all these lovely forms and it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. So we have done that by learning to say, when I do this, this this event here always happens. This is always the result. That's what we call science. We have a cause and an effect. What happens when we shift perception is really something that takes us into a whole new realm. Instead of having or waiting for a series of events to occur in which maybe we'll get the outcome that we want and maybe we won't, what happens as consciousness awakens to its own power is now it begins to experiment with creating different kinds of settings in which it can learn. And as it learns, it begins to very eclectically put things together from a multiple or multitude of, of situations. And what you get is a multi uh, linear, I guess I would call it, uh, reality or a multi-dimensional consciousness that is no longer limited to linear things. First this has to happen and then that has to happen and then these and then those and da-da-da. And instead, we go right for what is the outcome that we want and what are all the things, you know, that that could be set, you know, into place, into motion. Um, you know, and you it's think, a different approach. Do you think, Penny, at this level of your experience and at this level of your understanding, could you go to China without flying right now? Could you take part in that project in China in, in a kind of a bilocation, teleportation kind of a way? Um, I don't know. I, uh, you know, I didn't think about trying that. I might have to try that. 
I could have an impact without going just by getting on the phone and continuing to work with this um, this group that's you know working with within China. That's one way of having an impact. But there's part of me that says, "Oh no, Hanu, I want to go to China and see it physically." <laughs> so mm, yes. you know, there's when that piece is operating as strongly as it is, then you're likely to end up going to China physically. Gotcha. If, you know, if in fact I've already been there in a, you know, out of the body kind of sense, when I do go physically, it will be very familiar and I will probably see things that I've already seen and feel like I'm right at home. Right, yes, 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 yes. And many people indeed have that kind of experience of deja vu and so on. Now, mm-hmm. we must wind down here, Penny. Unfortunately, it is with regret that we really do have to close off our program. But in terms of a recap, we were listening to you, intrigued when you spoke about listening to our intuition, following your dreams, uh, your own Kundalini experiences, You spoke about meditation and how consciousness affects our health. You spoke about the Godhead and ecstatic sex. You spoke about the purpose of our lives and that beautiful, eloquent way you described the I am presence. And you said that death is our choice that ends an experience because we don't know any other way. I thought that was the most beautiful thing and most beautiful understanding of death. You also talked about learning the language of energy and how not to waste energy and in that way we also branched into a little bit about soul retrieval and lucid dreaming and that kind of thing we're not all one yet but we are all made of the same stuff another beautiful summary of the way you described how we feel that individuality right now we spoke about our multidimensional selves about creating different worlds about our energy the way we use it and misuse it we spoke about how Consciousness exists in order for us to create. Another beautiful statement that you made and that deserves a program all on its own. And then you branched into an area that I'm sure may upset some people, but others will be inspired by it, the fact that we are a body of Christ's. And then you worked on the present state of the world and how it is at the edge of destruction, but how we have it in our collective power to change that. And then we spoke a little bit about bilocation, teleportation, shifting consciousness, and that whole time-based reality that we're in, as opposed to an eternity-based system. All wonderful, absolutely inspiring concepts. Now, we do have to say goodbye to you, unfortunately. We've got a few little announcements that we want to run through. So if we could reconnect at some time in the future, if you could stay in touch with us so that we will be able to put out on the air and to our listeners about your forthcoming online courses and so on. And uh, all your contact details will be on pennykelly.com as well as on our own website. Penny, let us say a profound and sincere thank you for everything that you've given us today. Mm. Thank you, both of you. I just love the way that you interview. Uh, congratulations on the Coast to Coast thing, and Gail. I think that's wonderful. Um, That'll be fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is fun. So, and I have just, it's been an honor to be part Thank of, you. of your program. I'll be contacting you shortly, Penny. Thanks. Okay, you're so welcome. Take care. Have a All wonderful right. day. Thank you very, very much, Penny, and we will talk again soon. Okay, now we have to announce the Coast to Coast AM radio show with Angel Rose and George Nuri next Wednesday, February 6th from 10 p.m. to midnight Pacific time. Yes, get on that. That's going to be absolutely wonderful. Also, go to 8stepstofreedom.com, 8 hyphen, that's a number 8, hyphen, steps, hyphen, 2 hyphen, freedom.com for our new program, The Eight Steps to Freedom. And then get hold of Angel Rose's book, A Time of Change, from a atimeofchange.info. That's all one word, a atimeofchange.info. You can also pre-order her new book, The Nature of Reality, from the thenatureofreality.info, all one word. And don't forget our group Akashic Records every Wednesday evening in San Diego. You'll find information about that on meetup.com. And if you search for Akashic Records Group or search for Ahanu, that's me, A-H-O-N-U, or Angel Rose, A-I-N-G-E-A-L-R-O-S-E dot com. And we will be putting these group Akashic Records online soon. So stay tuned to our website for that, angelrose.com. 
We're also going to be on iTunes shortly. So with that, we have to say goodbye and thank you for listening to Ahanu and Angel Rose on the Honest to God series, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye, everyone. This is the Art of Living Well Radio Network. Radio to inspire enlightened living. The Honest to God series with Anne Gail Rose and Ahanu.